We need people who think differently, who, who don't necessarily think like us all the time, right? Because diversity uh, matters. And I'm, just not, I'm not just talking about d- diversity from an ethnicity or um, perspective, but really just diversity of thought, like bringing in people who have these diverse views, who um, look and see uh, things differently. They solve problems differently. Um, to come to the table. And, and those teams are the teams that are most successful. This is a Security Weekly production. Security Weekly is a resource of Cyber Risk Alliance. The Cybersecurity Collaborative is proud to present CISO Stories, Each week, CISO Stories takes a deep dive on security leadership with one of the contributors to my latest book, the best-selling CISO Compass Navigating Cybersecurity Leadership Challenges with Insights from Pioneers, as well as other top CISOs and industry security leaders. The Cybersecurity Collaborative is a unique membership community enabling cybersecurity leaders to work together in a trusted environment. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com slash CSC or visit cyberleadersunite.com. I am your host, Todd Fitzgerald, and this week we welcome Nicole Ford, VP Global Security and CISO at Rockwell Automation, as well as an executive committee member at the Cybersecurity Collaborative. I think cyber found me. I didn't find cyber, so I wouldn't say I was immediately attracted. It was kind of like you go on a blind date and you go on a few dates and you figure, oh, yeah, I really like this, right? So that's... Um, kind of depicting my attraction. I think um, once um, I I got this really challenging assignment from one of my bosses who said, hey, build a cybersecurity program. And I said, I'm sorry, what's cybersecurity, right? This is before it actually had a name. So I'm pretty much dating myself. But, um, you know, I took the challenge and I actually built my first program. And I really enjoyed the work. I think that that was when I realized that it wasn't just a blind date anymore, right? It was like, it was like something that I could do for life. And, and so thus started my cybersecurity journey. I mean, there's so many different opportunities when in cybersecurity that when we say the word cybersecurity, people have that image of that hacker and a hoodie, but you know, investigating uh, things and and we know that the, this field is so much broader than that yeah i i remember i was watching um some movie and it kind of depicted this guy in the corner in the basement he was like i think he was 18 or something and i said well you know that's not really me i i don't know how to compare myself to what people traditionally think a cybersecurity professional should be And that was a little, that was a little tough for me, right? Because I had to, I had to figure out how did I fit in and what was I good at in, in cyber? Because you're right. There's so many disciplines. It's it's like this big field and we kind of lump it all together and just call it cyber. But in fact, it takes different people from different backgrounds to be a part of the cyber program to really make it work. And, And that is even how they think, right? Like engineers versus you know, somebody who majored in business or in somebody who's in marketing, they all bring a different perspective and, and flavor to cybersecurity. And so, you know, part of my journey was really learning about the different disciplines and um, really determining which ones I liked. And there are some that I'm not as great at. Right. And so that's where you bring in great people uh, with amazing skill sets to come in and round out the team. Mm hmm. Well, I think that's a great lead into our topic today, which is leading by leading with purpose. Um, so what do you mean by that? Well, I think that, you know, kind of thinking about my journey in cybersecurity and how I started really being intentional about your team, um, who you bring in and, and how you create that team, um, I think is important. I've learned this along the way, right? Let's go back to that that kind of vision of the guy who's, you know, sitting in the basement kind of with a hoodie, black hoodie on. And I can just I can visualize him. Right. Um, I think we all kind of start there. But then we realize quickly that we need people who think differently, 
who, who don't necessarily think like us all the time, right? Because diversity uh, matters. And I'm, just not, I'm not just talking about d- diversity from an ethnicity or um, perspective, but really just diversity of thought, like bringing in people who have these diverse views, who um, look and see uh, things differently. They solve problems differently um, to come to the table. And, and those teams are the teams that are most successful. When we can bring people in um, with different viewpoints and different ethnicities, and for me, being intentional means I've made a decision that my teams will be 50-50, 50% male, 50% um, female. Um, and, and how do I build out that type of, of organization um, and stick to that is, is really important to me. And so I set that target. That's my goal. And, and I really work on programs and, and pipelines to really make that happen. Um, and that's happened over time. I think it's, you know, you develop your, your strategy and you're very intentional about it and you, and you communicate it to others, right? And you get them on board with, Hey, I want to have a 50% male, 50% female team, or I want to have, you know, 20 to 30% of my team should be minorities. Like, when you put that goal, um, you know, in place, telling people about it and getting them onboarded is really important. And then tracking from from a perspective of saying, how am I doing against my goal periodically, I think is critical. Holding yourself accountable to that. Have you found that that difficult in an industry where, you know, depending on what stat you read, if it's 10 percent or 14 percent or 25 percent? women and now you're trying to build something that's 50 percent women uh, has that been a challenge for you oh my god yes like when you talk about getting into the manufacturing industrial manufacturing industry like it's not like sexy people are like oh hold on so what, what industry it's not like financial services you're like yeah i get to fight the bad guys i get to save people's you know, their, their retirement, their money, right? I, there's something, in, if you're going into healthcare, it's like, oh, healthcare, I get to save and sustain lives. I get to do, save people, help people um, to sustain or live long lives. Um, so industrial manufacturing is hard to understand. And I think, you know, at first blush, people are like, um, it's not like the most uh, attractive industry, but that's where I think it, it's really about my story and telling people, giving them a value prop that they can understand about why industrial automation and industrial manufacturing is exciting and why this is the industry they need to be a part of, right? And when I can set that stage and tell that story, I really don't have a problem bringing people on. Plus, people like working for good people or people that they can connect to and relate to. And when they can see people that look like them, um, that are like them, that maybe even sometimes think like them, um, they're attracted to that. And that that has been really a key to my success is really being able to paint a picture for many of the candidates that I talk to, um, whether they're at Nesby, right, or SWE or other um, organizations that really have career fairs where we're trying to build pipelines. Telling that story effectively is critical to bringing and onboarding people. I know I found it it difficult. We, we at the Cybersecurity Collaborative, which you are uh, a member of the executive uh, committee, which which we we really appreciate. Um, the we were looking at our board a couple of years ago. And we said, okay, let's look at our board. And we had seven white males and one female on the board. <laughs> and we said, we have to change this. And so we in when so when you talk about intentional, um, we changed the board. We expanded the board to like 15 people, but we are 50% diverse because we said that if we're going to to show this industry what it looks like, um, we have to we have to be representative of that. And we didn't just want to fill up the board with somebody that was in that slot. We needed really good people, but I knew that they were there. 
um, the, the challenge that I found is that I was going after all these people that everybody else was going after too, because there's, right, there's a small minority of people that fit that. So, you know, the value proposition has to be really good as to why you want to participate on this board versus that board. And, and I'm sure within your company, you have to have that that same value proposition when you're going after people. So part of this is selling. You're selling, right? You're selling why this is the best place to be. Like the cybersecurity collaborative, the services that you offer to, you know, organizations like mine is invaluable, right? Why wouldn't we want to be a part of it, right? So part of even my conversation with you about it, I remember having a conversation with you and you sold it really effectively. And that, remember, it's the story. People want to hear a compelling story. They want to understand why this would be a value to them. And when you can tell that story effectively and you can kind of build, I, I consider this like a need, right? Like I, you know, I have to need the cybersecurity collaborative. And when you can help me understand what need you feel, then of course mm -hmm. it, it, it's very attractive to me. And so that's, that's the story. I think it's, people want to do interesting things, right? We, mm -hmm. we don't want to be, we, a lot of people are really focused on what value am I bringing, right? How do I connect to the goals and objectives of the organization? And we got to do a better job of, of that connection when it comes to cybersecurity, right? We have a direct connect to the ability for an organization to drive profitability, right? And that's because of the work that we do day in, day out um, to protect, defend and protect organizations. The controls we put in place, uh, the, what we oversee, is, is so very important. And, and when we can tell that story, right? When, mm -hmm. when you're asked by somebody, why should I join X? Or, you know, why is this the right industry for me? Having, you know, sound bites relative to why that industry should be attractive to that candidate is so important. And, you know, I, I think it goes back to mentorship and you know you've been a big advocate in in the field Todd for a long time and you supported many of us that were coming up um throughout our careers and and so you know people don't forget that when you start to think about what do I want to be a part of is this something that's going to continue to help develop me um and help me in my career as well as um allow me to do meaningful work and I think all of those factors together really speak to why a person decides to join an organization or, you know, um, kind of a, a an organization like a, a cybersecurity collaborative or Rockwell Automation or some other org. Mm -hmm. Uh, you make me want to come work for your company right now. Um, I, I mean, I want to be part of that. Everybody wants to be part of something. And so when when you have all these different diverse viewpoints and race, ethnicity, gender, how do you how do you leverage that and make sure that you're getting the the pieces that everybody's bringing to the table once once you've uh, assembled all the different parts. So that it, that's really uh, speaks to kind of talent development, right? So all of us, right? If you're in the space, you're always in the talent development. You're always thinking about like, how do I challenge my workforce? Uh, what type of work do I provide to them? Uh, what training do they get, right? And so I love to provide stretch assignments to individuals and employees. I love making sure that we have kind of challenging work assignments, training. Um, we're, we're working on and understanding that this work that we're going to do will contribute to X, right? So I, I really challenge my team to provide those uh, challenging assignments or stretch assignments to our team members and make it fun. It's like cyber is tough, right? All the work that we do to, to protect companies you know, some of it is thankless, right? We're we're up in the middle of the night sometimes. Mm -hmm. We're we're kind of chasing something down, but it's necessary. And mm -hmm. how do we make it fun for those that are part of our teams? How do we help them connect the dots 
on what, you know, what it does and, and how it supports the organization, but also finding um, new challenges or problems to solve, right? Mm-hmm. And giving those opportunities to our workforce, I think, is so important. So it's not just that, and you know, I love the blocking and tackling. We have to do that well. We always talk about cyber hygiene, but let's also talk about AI and ML and the practical applications of those um, new technologies and, and kind of, you know, paradigms and process. How do we apply it to the work that we do? Or, you know, think about when RPA came out, right? Innovative ways to use RPA to really help drive efficiency in our own processes. Like it's just really thinking about how we apply technology to solve modern problems and how do we bring um, those opportunities and challenges to bear with our teams and and get them to solve some of them. And that that's the meaningful work, right? It's moving the needle, leveraging innovation where we can, challenging our team to continue to move the needle and and make things better within the organization. And I think that that really keeps people involved, engaged, and, and they stay with the company. The article this podcast is based upon can be viewed in the best-selling cybersecurity leadership book, CISO Compass, Navigating Cybersecurity Leadership Challenges with Insights from Pioneers. So, so how at the at the front end when you're evaluating people to bring them into the organization, how do you how do you look at them to make sure you've got that right person that's going to fit with the rest of your team? Yeah, I love that. So, I'm looking for a little bit of a spark, right? You always want to, you know, you want somebody who is super excited, or you can you can hear the passion in their voice. I look for problem solvers. I look for people who can think. So, I like to provide people scenarios. Because I want to understand how you think about a problem, how you dissect the problem. I'm also looking for people who will weave in other people, right? Team members. How do you collaborate is important. We This is a team sport. Like everything we do um, requires. So, so what's, a, what's an example of a people scenario that you would give? Well, it depends, right? So let me think. Um, so if I am looking at you know, how a person collaborates, I'll provide a problem. I'll say, hey, you know, it's three o'clock in the morning. You get a, um, you know, you, you get some sort of alert. The alert says X, Y, Z. Um, who do you call? What do you do? And I'm and I'm just walking through how would, so if you're early career, how would you, and you don't have the experience, but you're responsible for that alert. How would you handle that situation, right? Or, you know, you, you're, you're, in the middle of a project, um, you're implementing a very important control. Um, the engineering team comes to you and says, hey, maybe we shouldn't implement that control because it's going to impact um, our ability to produce X, right? Like, what's your next step? Walk me through what you're going to do to either uh, convince this person that you need to implement this control um, or is there a compromise? Like, so walk me through how you actually arrive at a, at a solution. I, I really like that. I mean, I've done a lot of uh, behavioral interviewing in my career of, you know, tell me a time when blah, blah, blah <laughs> in their experience. But now you're having them sink on the spot uh, as far as what they would do. I think it's important, right? When you think about people that you want on your team, the question is, are you customer focused? Or not, right? So there's questions that will kind of bring out that um, skill set. Um, what are the? What do you care about the most as it relates to team members? What are the common competencies that you believe uh, are necessary and 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 recipe for success on your team? And only you know that, right? Because you either have a high performing team, high growth team. I mean, there are different types of teams, and depending on what you're trying to build, you need to make sure that everybody that's a part of that team exhibits and embodies those competencies. Do you, do you see a difference between how men and women, not that we can, you know, generalize, but do, do you see some some differences that, that women are bringing to the workforce that maybe the men weren't so good at? 
So this is a great topic and I've never been asked this question. So this is a great question. Women are really good multitaskers. And what I mean by that, they can do more than one thing at a time. And I don't mean, so let's not think about focus, but more so we always have a lot on, on our plate. And a lot of times what's interesting is a woman is going to come and say, you know what, I can get all these things done, but here's probably the, the priority or here's the way in which I'm going to get it done. Guys think a little differently about a problem or a set of tasks that they need to complete, right? And and I think that the differences are they're still going to get it done. It may take them a little bit more time than the woman. She's going to be a little bit more creative in the way that she handles the task. But men and women think differently when it comes to how do we tackle specific issues. Um, there's a different attention to detail when it comes to communicating and, and writing that I think, again, men are very direct in the way that they write, whereas women are going to give you a little bit more detail. And in some respects, depending on what you're doing, think about an incident response when it comes to documenting an incident. That matters, right? The the level of detail that's provided. Um, not to say men can't do it, but it's a skill that I've seen women mm -hmm. have. Um, I think that they do and are more creative when it comes to things like um, security awareness. And when it comes to really kind of what are some things we can do to change behaviors? Um, because they're a little bit more insightful as it relates to people. Um, not to say men can't do it, but those are just areas where I really think that women, um, they really elevate the game and, and they make, um, they make programs, uh, more effective. I, I once worked for an organization that we get the, uh, we're one of the award winners of the governor's glass ceiling award, which meant that more than 50% of your executives were women. Wow. And, and it was a healthcare company. So you would kind of expect that there's in healthcare, there's, there's a lot of the helping. And so there were a lot more women in the workforce to begin with, um, that attracted it to that. Um, but one thing I noticed was that the collaboration, uh, on things seem to be seem to be at a little bit higher level. There seem to be more competition sometimes when you have an all male. If if you don't have a balance there, if you don't have at least a couple of women in there to like soften the yes. competition. Not that women aren't competitive, but it just, I felt there's there's differences in organizations where you see them all one way or all the uh, all all the other way. So women ask for help. There's a little bit of a difference and you kind of know, right? Guys don't love getting directions. So, you know, now that we have MapQuest on our phones or, you know, we have the ability to <laughs> um, find directions quickly was a savior for men, but um, they don't always ask for questions. And, and they're sometimes hesitant to say, I don't know. But women, for whatever reason, you know, we're, we're quick to say, hey, I'm going to go call Sally Sue and, and say, hey, can you help me walk me through how I should think about this issue? Or what did you do to solve this issue? And I think that, you know, really leveraging best practices, we, we know to do that, right? We're not going to reinvent the wheel all the time. And I think it's, mm. those are some of the differences. Is we're not afraid to go, hey, Todd, you know what? I haven't really tackled that. So can you walk me mm -hmm. through maybe things I yeah. need to get there? Yeah, I, I I think we can, we can all learn from each other. <clears throat> how how do we how do we you know move beyond you know people that are that are trying to have diverse workforces and into this space where we have them? Uh, when I was at RSA at the last RSA, uh, I went to a women in security forum, uh, and I was one of the three guys there. Um, I went to a, uh, cybersity, uh, forum that, that was, you know, uh, put on by or co-founded by Devin Bryan, who's also one of our board members. Um, I think I was one of the minorities in the room, uh, at that event. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I see that, you know, I've been to some, uh, she leads tech events. 
uh, where I've been one of five people out of a hundred that were male in a female room. And so I've started to, to have, you know, understand what it's like to be the minority in the room. Um, how do we, how do we get this to be to that 50 50 level, uh, across the industry? I think it has to be a commitment to crowdsource. So think about it, right? So you know you're going to an event at RSA um, where we're talking about diversity and inclusion or you know breaking barriers. You got to bring somebody with you, and that's what I was telling somebody the other day. I said, you know, when we think about diversity and inclusion, we want people to to just feel like they need that, like this is the the right workshop for me to attend. We got to go and recruit. We got to recruit people. We got to go and recruit our our white colleague, our white male colleague and say, hey, listen, Mm -hmm. this is really for you. Can you, you know, I think you'd get a lot out of it. I would be forever grateful if you'd at least attend and and really kind of invoke allyship, right? Allyship is the key. Like we don't change this by ourselves. 50-50 doesn't come from within. It comes from external, right? And really recognizing that we've got to bring our male, our white male colleagues and Mm -hmm. others to the table so that they can hear the message and understand how important they are to solving the problem. I think one of the things that um, I make a I make an effort to do is bring a colleague. I'm going to bring a colleague and explain to them why it's important for them to be there. And I think all of us need to do that and tell them allyship is extremely important and you're the key. And when they figure out that it's not us that we need to solve the problem, it's them, that opens the doors and, and it really helps them. And I've even yeah. sat down and helped them understand, like, what does it mean to be a Black female in cyber, right? Not just a Black female, but in cyber. And, you know, when you open their eyes, they they really then, you know, take it upon themselves to, to show up to those events and really uh, learn. Mm-hmm. So what does that mean to be a black female in cyber? I think sometimes it's it's being the one and only, right? It's it's being the unicorn. Somebody called me a unicorn. The first time they called me a unicorn, I had to ask, like, I'm sorry, a unicorn? Like, I don't think I look like a unicorn. So help me understand. But it's like finding a unicorn. You know, unicorns aren't real. So finding one is very rare. So sometimes it's 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 feeling that way. It's like feeling like you're the only one. And to me, um, because that's the case, it's my voice has to be heard. Mm -hmm. I have to be a part of the conversation and I need to use my role to get and bring more people along, especially black females or females just in general. So that goes back to being intentional and being an intentional leader Mm -hmm. that says, 50-50 50-50 is important, and it brings and provides more seats at the table. Yeah, exactly. And I think we can all learn from each other. I, I know I went to a, a presentation, and they were talking about the, the job descriptions and just the way the job descriptions oh, really? are written and, and, you know, how... Oh, it, if, you know, sometimes women look at the job descriptions and there's 10 things and, and th- they can only do eight of them. So they don't apply yeah. uh, where a guy says I can do six of them. And, oh, I think I'm going to apply for that. And and so it's just differences in, in culture or that the job description may sound like all this work. But, you know, you've got a family and you're taking care of that on the side, yeah. too. And it's like. You know, so we we have to be sensitive to all those things. And well, so so this has been great, Nicole. Um, I I, I think we could talk forever. <laughs> so, um, but what what final advice would you give to our listeners, whether they're emerging CISOs, new CISOs, uh, experienced CISOs, as they're going down this this journey to build more diverse workforces in not just race and gender, but also in in thought. I think you have to um, put more emphasis on your kind of workforce planning. I think it's really, really important. Be an intentional leader. Think about like what outcomes you want to see and and make them happen. Right. And also be open to creating those pipelines where you probably are going to have to develop people. 
um, and grow them up through your organization. And you have to be committed to that. And so I think that if I'm talking to an emerging CISO, it's so very important that you help to change the face of your team to match and reflect um, the, you know, the America that we all live in and, and really kind of be the champion to your people, to the women, to the minorities, and just different people, right? I I just, I can't impress upon it enough that our job is to manage risk. Our job is to defend and protect the organization, but our, our job is also to make sure we're bringing in great people with good skill sets and really um, moving the needle when it comes to who we bring in, how we bring them in and and cultivating them. So um, that's what those, that, those are my last words. I, I think that's a great place to leave it, Nicole. Um, thanks much for taking the time today. I know you're a very busy person. Thank you, Todd, for having me. And anytime I will come back and talk about amazing topics. Thank you. Visit more CISO Stories podcasts on securityweekly.com, where you will find an index of prior episodes. The Cybersecurity Collaborative is a unique membership community enabling cybersecurity leaders to work together in a trusted environment. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com slash CSC or visit cyberleadersunite.com.